just want to thank everyone for coming. This is the here. And I'm Will Ducharme. Uh, I'm Will Ducharme, and I'm going to be presenting about my independent study. So I did my independent study on C++. And so sort of the backstory of it was that after I completed AP Computer Science in 11th grade, I was still eager to continue exploring the subject. I managed to become proficient at using Java, but there were still tons of things out there that I didn't know. And so one day in class, when I overheard others talking about continuing computer science next year, I overheard Ian talking about an independent study program at the school offered. And so from there, Ian and I, Ian and I found out more information about the, program, about the independent study program, and we started deciding on what we want to cover next year. Now the topic of computer science covers a wide range of programs, languages, and ideas, and so it was a bit of a challenge to narrow it down to something we could cover in the scope of a year. In the end, however, we decided on learning the fundamentals of C++ since it was a pretty e easy language for beginners to learn, and it was pretty similar to Java <coughs> in terms of syntax. After deciding on topic, Ian and I decided that it would be beneficial for us both if we did a similar independent study program. We believe that this would allow us to help each other with any problems we had and that we could bounce ideas and questions off of one another, one another during the program. So once senior year began, it was a bit of an adjustment to get used to a class without an actual teacher. However, since Ian and I each had a third period study hall, we were able to do our ISP each day in the computer lab together. Now, what this average day would consist of would be we would go in there, sit at our desk, work through the textbook, which would include reading, going through problems and exercises and writing code, and then we talk about what we were learning and have any questions for each other. This cooperative working proved to be a huge help as it allowed us to keep each other working and motivated, made sure we didn't get stuck on any minor problems or issues, and allowed us to explain topics and ideas that were sometimes hard for one of us to grasp. However, even with this added benefit of having each other's help, we still encountered some problems, most notable of which was our problem with the graphical user interface, or a GUI. Now, going through the textbook the, and learning about the GUI wasn't too hard. In fact, it was pretty, we managed to read about it and finish the problems and exercises quite easily. However, the real fun started once we needed to actually create and customize our own GUI, which is exactly what we had to do for our final project. Now, our final project started out well, and we were able to create a nice looking interface However, once we began trying to implement functions into the interface, which we would do through buttons, we realized that we didn't know how to customize these buttons to do exactly what we wanted. We only knew how to use the buttons to go to the next page in a program, and we didn't really know how to make them do much else. So, we began reading outside sources as to how exactly we could go about making these buttons do what we wanted. We soon realized that in order to do that, we would have to go into material that was far beyond the scope of the basic fundamental we were doing that year. And so coming to this obstacle, we decided that the best way to fix this problem was to adapt a program. And so we decided to change our final program from one focused on graphics to one focused on functionality. And with this in mind, I was able to create my newly defined final program, Will's Library System, and as you can probably tell from the name, I was quite creative at the time. <laughs> now to give you an understanding of what this program is, it functions basically as a library's computer catalog keeps track of user accounts, the library inventory, and allows the user to make changes to that, to both of these. Upon starting the program, users greeted with the message of whether they would like to register a new account or log in with an existing account. If they choose to register a new account, they are prompted to enter in a new username and password for their account, and this account is added to the accounts list. Once the user is registered for their account, or if they initially chose to log in, then they are taken to this login account. From here, user enters in his, user, his username and password. Then the entered input is verified with the user's account list. And depending on which category the user's account list, the user's account is, they're taking the appropriate screen. If the user logs in with a basic library guest account, they are taken to this page. From here, the user is able to see which books are available to check out using the available command. Check in books with a check in command, and check out books with a check in. If the user instead logs into the library administrator account, they're taken to this page. As an administrator, the user is able to do much more. So alongside being able to check which books are available, check in books, and check out books, 
user is able to list the total number of books currently in the inventory with the list command. They are able to print out the table of the current library inventory with the inventory command. List all books currently checked out with the out command. Add a book to the inventory with an add command and remove a book from the inventory with the remove command. These final two commands, add and remove, permanently change the inventory and the program remembers books that have been added or removed from the inventory for the next time the program is used. Once the user has done everything they want, they can finally exit the program with the exit command. This command saves the user account list and the library inventory and any changes that have been made to them, and then closes the program. And that is the basis of how my program works. So, at the beginning of the ISP, I can honestly say I wasn't expecting much. I thought that I would simply be going into another class without a teacher and learning some more about computer science. What I didn't anticipate, however, was the learning that ISP would provide for me outside of C++. The ISP taught me to take responsibility in my own education, manage my learning in an organized and thorough fashion, and perhaps most importantly, adapt to changing situations. Enrolling in, enrolling in a class without a teacher, I gained not only another computer language, but also important lessons that I'll be able to carry. computer science courses, um, AP computer science, that I wanted to keep on going. I was pretty sure that computer science was where I was looking for my major and like college. And I didn't really want to just spend my senior year like taking a year off from the subject. Um, so the independent study program seemed like the perfect opportunity to continue studying something that I really enjoy and also kind of demonstrate my interest to potential colleges. Um, I got my project idea during junior year as well. So all of y'all here today know that we use Naviance, and um, there's a really cool tool on the website where like, you just enter what college you're interested in, and it'll compare your stats. Um, so I thought that was really useful, and I looked for a Naviance app on my phone, because like, if you're just using your phone, it's really hard to access the website but it had like two, two and a half stars, I think, on the App Store in iOS, and there wasn't even an app for Androids, and I have an Android phone, so I figured I'd just make one myself. So, <laughs> um, my work days were a little different from Ian and Will's. I didn't really think to set aside a study hall for specifically my independent study. So my work days were basically whenever I could fit a chunk of time in my weekend or on a like, not so busy school day. Um, the first semester of senior year, I worked with advanced concepts in Java, so I was basically building on what I'd already learned in AP Computer Science. Um, but the like, real stuff didn't really start until the second semester when I um, kind of moved into a new textbook, which was the Big Nerd Ranch Guide to Android Programming. And um, I started learning about Android concepts and um, XML. Um, so there were lots of unexpected ups and downs this year. Um, the good parts included Android Studio, which is the developing environment for Android. Um, it's really easy to use. I'm going to talk more about it later. but. Um, it was a really great surprise to actually be able to quickly learn it and kind of move forward with my project. Um, and then the Google Play Developer Console, which is how you basically just use your Gmail account, you pay like a $20 developer fee, and then you can publish to Google Play. And it's really simple, really easy, and it was a really cool part of the project. So the bad parts. Um, when you're like on your own and you don't have a teacher or a class um, to kind of work with and think about solutions to all your different problems, it's kind of, it can get really frustrating because, um, I don't know, you, you come up on problems that you didn't think you would really see, but if you're doing a computer science project, there's so many resources just online. Like Google was my best friend this year. Like I would just put in whatever questions I had and then 
There's so many different coding communities that will like help you out, and it's really great. Um, and then there's the bugs. So I have here some photos of my um, most unfortunate mistakes. Um, so basically, on the upper right, I believe you'll see the a, like image of a phone. That's um, a simulator, and right smack dab in the middle is the worst message you could probably possibly see if you're a developer. It's the crash message, and so. This happened the first time I ever tried to simulate my app, and it was like after I finished the entire code, and I was so excited, and then it wouldn't even start. It just like <laughs> gave me a blank page in that message. Um, but Android Studio has a fix for that, which I'll talk about. Um, and then the other two images are literally just after I fixed the crash, it was it kept just comparing GPA to math scores and like ACT was going to SAT and I didn't know where my variables were labeled wrong, but it was literally out of multiple hundreds of lines of codes, it was in the first 50 that I'd screwed up. So luckily it didn't take too long to track down those bugs, but it could get really frustrating. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little more about Android Studio and the environment. Um, this is basically the setup you'll see as a developer. Um, on the left side of the screen is a file that you're coding in, you just manually enter the code. This is an XML file. Um, and XML is kind of to Android as like CSS is to web pages, for those of you who um, understand computer science, sorry. <laughs> um, so like um, XML files will handle the layout and kind of the location of all of your aspects of the app. Um, and then you also pair that with Java files, which will um, kind of take care of all the actions that you want to happen and the user um, inputs and stuff. Um, and this is one of the like coolest aspects of Android Studio. It's the device simulator. So this is how people can um, develop Android apps even if they don't have an Android um, device to like test on or if you're using a Mac instead of a PC or something. Um, so you basically create um, and a like little phone inside of your computer, so it acts the exact same way as like my handheld device would, but it's on your desktop. Um, so yeah, here you can see just like the home screen of it, and then it running my app working. Thank goodness. And then you can actually just like go into it and search the internet like you would on your normal smartphone. Um, so this is the debugging aspect of Android Studio. So this is how when um, my app crashed, I was able to go back and fix it after I kind of um, took a break for a bit. <laughs> um, so basically, there's a log of um, all of the actions that happened up to the moment where your error occurred, the error that caused your app to crash. And um, Android Studio just like will give you a little blue link. Oh, this is the bottom half, by the way, is what we're looking at, the red stuff. Um, so you can see where it's boxed. There's um, a little blue link. And that link, if you click on it, takes you right back to the line that caused the crash. And so you can look at it and figure out what you did wrong and fix it and move on. Um, OK, so my final product was um, a long time coming. It, um, it basically, here you can see kind of the flow of how it works. You come in and you've got the home page. You press start to begin. It takes you to um, a page that asks you to input your information, your GPA, your test scores. And then in the next um, activity, each, each individual page is called an activity for Android. And then, um, so in the next one, you enter your university that you want to compare yourself to. And then moving on, it'll display your stats versus their stats. And you can go back to change your GPA if it's like, um, if you need to update it, or you can switch to college. Um, yeah, so um, like I said, the Google Play developer console is a, was a really cool part of the project. So I was actually able to publish my app on Google Play. And 
a really cool part of Google Play is that it will take you like 30 minutes to a few hours to like get it published once you submit your um, app application. Like you're, you actually have to fill out like information about your app. Um, but that's a really, really fast amount of time compared to um, the Apple um, App Store. It can take up to a week to get your app um, reviewed and then at that point they could ask you to like resubmit it if they don't um, like how you put it together and then it might take another week to like get it reviewed again. Um, so kind of in conclusion, this experience was honestly a lot of fun. I don't know, it was um, frustrating at times, but to get to like see the final product and look back on the work that I did this year and you know see it on the Play Store and be able to say, hey, you know, I did that. Um, that's really a really cool part of this year for me. And um, I think it was also a really good tr transition into next year when like, like college courses, the professors aren't really as hands-on as all the teachers here at Cooper. And so kind of having to take like my education into my own hands for this um, period of time was um, a really great experience. And um, I look forward to continuing to make Android applications. <laughs> Thank you. I originally didn't actually want to do an independent study. I wanted to take the environmental science class at Cooper, but there weren't enough interested students. So Dr. Davies told me about this independent study program, and she suggested that I do a project, which is, in my opinion, a bit more interesting than just doing textbook work. And I also got to gain experience doing a scientific study and gain knowledge in another scientific field while I was, I was still kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to major in. And for a typical work day for me, I originally set deadlines. So uh, every two weeks or so, I would have something new I wanted to accomplish. But I found that first semester with all of my college applications and everything else that was going on with my academic schedule, I kept pushing my deadlines back. So I instead had to start scheduling time for myself. So I would do like a study hall on a Friday or an hour Wednesday or six hours Sunday if I was collecting data. And so I studied biodiversity, which is basically the comparison of the total number of organisms in an area compared with the total number of species in the area. So if everything is of the same species, like the grass in the Cooper Quad, or if everything is a different species. And diverse ecosystems are very balanced and they have interdependent networks between all of the different organisms and species. So they can really balance themselves and they're very hardy. Whereas undiverse ecosystems are unbalanced and they require human intervention to maintain. And this human intervention comes in forms such as uh, petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides, which are chemicals that can eventually leach into the water supply and affect human health. So, and also undiverse ecosystems are more vulnerable towards natural disasters, such as insect infestations and disease, because if uh, something affects one, Plant, it will affect all of them because they're all the same thing. There are no buffers. And balanced ecosystems can also moderate temperature of the area as well as water levels, which can help to prevent um, droughts and flooding. So this is more than just like a statistic. It really has a big impact. My hypothesis was if biodiversity levels reflect degrees in land management, then the most natural ecosystems will contain the highest levels of biodiversity. And I chose to compare two different uh, land areas. Uh, my natural ecosystem, I chose Dr. Davis's property because uh, she allowed me to have access to it. And since she owns it, I got to have a very um, detailed knowledge of exactly how she manages it, which is hardly at all. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing for this study. And then um, for my artificial managed ecosystem, I chose 
the Cooper campus, which has been newly landscaped in the quad area. And that was really good because I could just work on it during my study hall or something because I'm up here all the time. And it's also very managed and newly landscaped at the moment. Um, and so for collecting the data, I chose to count and identify each organism as well as I could in a one acre area. So my sample size was one acre. But I kind of ran into some problems because the picture that you see on the left is a picture of the meadow at Dr. Davis's property. In my natural ecosystem, I had a meadow, a uh, forest, and a pond area, and each one of those counted as a third of an acre in my study. So I got to reflect the diversity in a natural ecosystem. And I couldn't count every single grass organism in this entire meadow, as you can imagine, and I couldn't count every single grass organism in the Cooper Quad, so I instead used a quadrat, which is this one meter squared piece of PVC piping. And I would lay this on the ground, as you can see in the picture, and I would count everything and identify everything in that one meter squared. And I would use that, uh, and I would multiply that to be to reflect the entire meadow. And I took several of these for, I think, like eight or so per ecosystem. And then, since I had to identify things, I would take pictures on my phone. So there's a picture of a mushroom, me holding a walking stick, there's a grasshopper in the top right, and then a folio lichen. And then these are the tree. This is a very large tree, Dr. David's <laughs> property. You can see me on the left, I'm holding my tape measure for measuring the area, and then also my field journal. Uh, I had a field journal for uh, taking notes. So on the left is a picture of all the notes of the organisms that I took. I took natural samples for identification later. And then uh, I drew pictures of like leaf shapes and things. And then I also had to calculate area of like the grass and the quad. So I have a picture of that with measurements on the right. So then for the results, going to show you my spreadsheet with all of my raw data. So these are all of the numbers that I counted by hand and all of the <laughs> organisms that I identified. So this is just for the natural ecosystem. And then for the Cooper campus, I was actually, except for the grass, able to identify and count everything rather than taking quadrats. So there's awful lot of data. So to calculate the biodiversity, I use the Simpsons Biodiversity Index, which has scores between 0 and 1, 0 being the least diverse, uh, meaning everything is the same type of species, and then 1 is the most diverse, meaning everything is a different kind of species. And uh, the natural ecosystem at Dr. Davies' property had a biodiversity score of 0.781, whereas the, natural, the artificial ecosystem had a score of 0.001. Here's a graph just displaying how great that difference is. And I found that this is actually mostly because of the grass in the Cooper Quad, because you don't realize how each grass organism is just a, a very, very small amount of area. So there are thousands of grass organisms in the Cooper Quad, and they're, since they're all the same species of grass, this really created a great difference in the biodiversity levels. But I also classified all of the different organisms I found. So in the natural ecosystem, there was a greater balance between plants and animals and fungi. So it was more balanced and interdependent relationships were present. Whereas in the artificial ecosystem, compared to plants, there hardly were any animals or fungi, which again leads back to why chemical intervention is needed. So as a potential solution, I researched a bit and found that you can still landscape an area uh, if you use permaculture and 
Permaculture is a more natural and biodiverse form of landscaping. It's self-sustaining, uh, so all of the plants are, you won't find just a row of roses like you will in the quad. Um, you'll instead have them spread out, so if disease or pests affects one, it doesn't affect all of them, which means that you don't need those chemical pesticides. The rainwater is sufficient for the plants' needs. You don't need sprinklers because you use native plants, which are have adapted to the water of the region. And then you allow the natural plant detritus to decompose, which restores richness and eliminates the need for chemical fertilizers and mulch. And here's a sketch of a potential permaculture design for actually a classroom rooftop area. Uh, so you can see that there's a water feature which would attract animals to deal with pests and it's a very balanced and diverse area. So the takeaways from the process for me, I definitely learned how to manage my time and how to fix problems independently that I would come across I wasn't exactly expecting and I think that all of these um, very ways of independent studying and working on a project by myself without a teacher being there all the time and deadlines that they're keeping up on me. I think that this will really help me in college and just in my future careers. Thank you. Are there any questions? study was an exploration into beginner C++ and if I get a little bit technical or start rambling on I'm sorry I'm really excited about this so you just have to uh, have to stay with me so the goals going in my goal going into the independent study was to understand the methodology methodology and syntax of C++ to understand what the code is why it does what it does and the way I was planning on accomplishing that was using a textbook by Bajaran Shvastra, the creator of C++, and uh, creating at least one complete program, hopefully with a graphical user interface, a GUI, but um, you'll see how that turned out in the later slides. Uh, so, C++, the language itself. Um, I did not have very much experience with the C division of programming. Uh, I had a Java experience from computer science and AP computer science, but as you can see above, there is a difference between Java and C++. So Java, it takes a lot of syllables to do things. System.out.println, hello world, and parentheses, semicolon. Well, in C++, I can do the same thing with C out, hello world, and, and the like. So it was refreshing to be able to do things quickly. There's not a lot of typing, uh, not a lot of uh, preparation when starting the line. But that, that was one of the differences. The similarities is they were both object-oriented programming languages, which, as you can see above, is the idea that you define an object and then you were able to branch off from that object, create new versions, iterate, and uh, if you need a different type of object, you can create a different type of object and go along with that. Uh, the one thing that did confuse me with C++ is the idea of uh, dependencies. So C++ is very specific on, what, on where things are. You always need to define what you're looking for, where it is, and why you need it. In Java, it's kind of loosey-goosey. You just pick and choose what you want, and Java just kind of rolls with it. So having to manually define what I needed was a pretty big change. Uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, as I call it, Microsoft Visual Complication, was my development environment for this independent study. And as you can see above, it didn't go too smoothly. Uh, 491 errors was my largest count when I tried running my project file at home. But Besides that, Microsoft Visual Studio is incredibly powerful and way more than I was expecting. Uh, sometimes I would go to run my program to test it out and a window like the diagnostic tools would pop up and I would have no idea what was going on. Because 
that's a lot of information to be uh, bombarded with when you just want to see if you're outputting what you should be outputting. In addition, it was hugely helpful in learning things about dependencies um, through the Solution Explorer, which is tells you what you're looking for, where you need it. As I mentioned, it just simplifies C++'s uh, dependence on dependencies. So, moving on, the textbook that I used was Bjarne Schweifstrup's Programming Principles and Practice. He's the guy who created the language, so I figured it would be good to follow his word. And uh, Will and I, working together, worked through up to chapter 16. Uh, we worked, we read through the textbook, and it was incredibly helpful for general coding practices. Um, not only did it cover the specific C++ language, but talking about what code is and why it matters was a massive eye-opener for me, when previously I had been focused on getting the code to work for my computer science classes. The drills were helpful. There were, there's a difference between taking a project and doing it all at once and dividing it into steps. And the drills were projects, there was no mistake there, but they were very clearly labeled piece by piece, this is what you want to start with and this is what you want to get to. And that was extremely helpful in deadlining myself because I would go in expecting to do the whole drill and I'd end up with part one. And then there was part two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine to do, hopefully tomorrow. Um, the final project, Wintermute. Um, the name is from the book Neur uh, Neuromancer, which was considered one of the father of sci-fi books, and it's a really good read. I highly recommend it. Uh, Wintermute is an advanced AI in the book that attempts to break out of the prison defined by uh, humanity for it. My program, not quite so complex, it's an inventory management program. Uh, it's focused on simple, there, there's one character command, so you don't need to type in add, remove, delete, rent, it's A, R, C, you type in, you can just go. So that was the focus, as you can see above, the flowchart described my thought process when designing a final program. I needed a program, and I wanted to do a, a LAN messenger, kind of like Skype, but for a local, a local network. And then I realized I had to network computers, and networking computers is really hard. So that kind of got shot down quickly. So I went into inventory management, and the first iteration on that was Invento, because the best way to invent a product name is to cut off the last three letters. Um, so after I did, went up with Invento, I started building user accounts, I started building a GUI, and as Will mentioned yesterday, that building a GUI wasn't the hard part. Getting the GUI to do something was the hard part. So that got scrapped, and it was, we moved on to Wintermute, which I focused on making user-friendly, uh, quick to enter commands, you could have multiple inventories that could be called up at will and closed, and were saved between sessions, so I could log in on Tuesday, add an item, log out, log in on Thursday, add another item, or remove the original, so on and so forth. And it was text-based, which, in my opinion, more things should be text-based because it doesn't take a lot of effort to get it working, and it doesn't take a lot of effort to run it. And that was one of the big things I learned, is that you don't need a big, flashy interface when a text-based one works eight times faster and is eight times easier to use. So, the extra skills I learned through this independent study were, of course, time management, setting my own deadlines, completing the drills, reading the textbook, uh, and in addition, there was no safety net, which increased a, caused a massive increase in problem solving. The idea that I had a problem and I couldn't go to someone to get it worked out. I could bounce ideas off Will, he bounced ideas off me, and we could work together to get it solved, but there was no, no support net, except for online. Online, the Google Stack Overflow specifically, uh, was a massive help in many of the exercises, and the textbook was popular enough that people were posting answers online. So if Will and I were stuck on part one, for three days of a drill, we could go online, see what other people did, and adapt our code to, uh, to do the same thing that they did. Another thing I learned was program design efficiency and efficiency. 
the large part of Visual Studio that I mentioned was the diagnostic tools, and while they weren't massively helpful to me here, it, it opened my eyes to the idea that programs had to be efficient, and without efficiency, you're relying too much on hardware, and it all kind of falls apart from there. <laughs> the last thing was more time management, but specifically for programming, um, you go in one day expecting to do a task, and you get it half done. And you come in the next day and start working on the other task to realize that your task yesterday is half done. And things like GitHub, which is a website a code repository where you can upload your code and update it and revert back to previous versions, would have been incredibly useful. And I wish I'd used it, but I didn't. <laughs> and that's a problem. Uh, but not only that, I learned to properly comment my code, uh, titling things, titling what things did, why they were there, why I needed them, and really just keeping myself organized. So. Was I successful in my goal? Well, I finished the textbook. I understand enough C++, and I have one fully functioning program lacking in GUI, but it's, it's what I was looking for. So I, I believe, yes, I was successful in my independent study, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it helps me in my future endeavors. Thank you.